Chapter 24, The Return of Kicker. The deal is, I'm not supposed to bother anybody at the hospital. Yeah, right. Like me being there is going to screw things up. The way everybody is acting around here, you're supposed to shut up and not do anything but wait, which makes me crazy. So early the next morning, when Grimm is still snoring loud enough to rattle the window panes, I get up and sneak out of the house. The way I figure, I can check on Freak and be back in time for breakfast. No harm done. It doesn't work out like that, to say the least. The sun is just coming over the mill pond, and there's this spooky mist on the water. You can hear all the frogs making a racket under the lily pads, and the mosquitoes sound like bullets whizzing by. And I have to kind of slap and run until I get clear of that smelly old pond. Moving fast, like the sun is chasing my heels, I'm running down this long, faint shadow of me that stretches out ahead. You can't ever catch up with it. I'm thinking with my feet, like the rest of me is still asleep. Not that I'm completely alone. There's this one old guy. He's actually out cutting his lawn. He's got these headlights rigged up on his rider mower. And he's wearing pajamas, too, like it's normal. Everybody does it. When I get to the hospital, the streetlights are just click, starting to click off. The lobby is empty, and there's nobody at the desk to tell me I can't be visiting patients at the crack of dawn. There are plenty of nurses in the ICU, though, and they see me coming. This one woman runs right out from behind the telemetry station, and she's got her hands up to her mouth, and I'm pretty sure she's trying to shush me, even though I'm not making any noise. She's not telling me to be quiet, though. She's saying, Oh my God, you must be Maxwell, even though she's never seen me before in her life. I go, is Kevin back yet? Oh dear, oh dear, she says. Is he going to be okay? Oh dear, she says, oh dear. Now more nurses are coming out of the ICU. One of them is what, the one I accidentally bumped into yesterday. And when she sees me, she goes, better page Dr. Spivak. Kevin was her patient. That's when I noticed that some of the nurses are crying and looking at me strange. And all of a sudden, I just go nuts. Just go nuts. I'm saying, no way. No way. And this nurse is trying to throw a hug on me. And I push her away. Then I'm running down the hall and it's like I'm kicker again, ready to just blast anybody who dares touch me. And I have to keep running. I'm skidding around the corners and bumping into walls, and no one can touch me, even if they're brave enough to try. I just keep running and running until I get to these glass doors that say medical research. The doors are locked, and it's dark inside. Behind me, people are shouting to call the guards, and I punch my hand right through the glass, and I'm inside, skidding over broken glass through the dark, and I keep going until I come to another set of doors. No admittance. No glass this time. They're solid, so I can't punch through, and I'm kicking and kicking and slamming into the doors, and that's when all the hospital cops catch up with me. A bunch of them jump on me, and I keep going, running around in circles like an accident of nature, until finally, there are so many of them on me, I can't stand up anymore. They're putting handcuffs on my wrists and my ankles, and they're sitting on me and going, we'll have to medicate him. And this one cop says, with what, an elephant gun? That's how Dr. Spivak finds me, covered with cops. She's this worried face leading down. Her eyes are red and blurry, and she's saying, I'm sorry, Maxwell. We did our best. Better let me bandage up that hand. You're bleeding. He believed you, I say. You said you could give him a new body, and he believed you. What are you talking about? The special operation, I say. The bionics unit. Dr. Spivak makes the cops let me up and says she'll be responsible, but they leave the handcuffs on me just in case, and the cop who was talking about needing an elephant gun has his nightstick out, and he's ready to bop me if I make a move. Dr. Spivak sighs and says, somebody get me a coffee, please. And then she looks at me and goes, you'd better tell me all about it. So while she's bandaging up my hand, I tell her about how Freak has been coming to the special research lab every few months to get fitted for his new bionic body. 
and Dr. Spivak's face goes soft, and she nods to herself and says, well, that explains it. It was all a lie, wasn't it? I say. You were just telling him that so he wouldn't be scared. You know better than that, Maxwell. You couldn't lie to Kevin. I tried a little fib on him when he was about seven years old because I didn't think a child could handle the whole truth. And you know what he did? He looked up his disease in a medical dictionary. That's when I know she's telling the truth. Freak in his dictionary. Kevin knew from a very young age that he wasn't going to have a very long life, she says. He knew it was just a matter of time. So he was lying about getting a robot body? Dr. Spivak is shaking her head. I don't think it was a lie, Maxwell. Do you? I think he needed something to hope for. And so he invented this rather remarkable fantasy you describe. Everybody needs something to hope for. Don't call it a lie. Kevin wasn't a liar. No, I say. But what happened to him, really? I could tell you all the med medical terminology, she says. But what finally happened is his heart just got too big for his body. There was talk about arresting me for busting up the hospital. The cop with the nightstick was in favor. But finally, they released me into the custody of Grimm. On the way home, he goes, do you want to talk about it? Just leave me alone, I say. You got it, he says.